Welcome. Uh, my name is Megan Villar, and I get the honor of welcoming you to Denver Startup Week. So very ha happy that you're here. This is the first session of the day, um, and I think people are going to be trickling in. So. Um, Happy you're here. Thank you for coming. I hope you learned something from these incredible leaders up here on stage, um, but also just from someone sitting next to you. So please introduce yourself, um, say hello to your fellow neighbors, uh, and I get the honor of welcoming to the stage an incredible panel um, that I've had the, the chance to see before, um, and I know you're going to learn a lot. So with that, we have um, a topic on fractional talent with Christian, Julie, Dan, Brian, Jamie, and Kim who Kim actually cannot be here today, but um, she's incredible. So we thought we'd include her name in the session. So with that, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, thanks to uh, Denver Startup Week as well. As uh, Megan mentioned, Kim was going to moderate this panel and she got sick. So I jumped in last night. So uh, nice to meet you all. Thanks for joining today. Um, uh, Christian Salomini, I'm a fractional chief revenue officer. And uh, we're going to be going through a bunch of topics today. We did a similar uh, panel at Boulder Startup Week about four or five months ago. And what we found was the Q&A portion really took over at the end and we ran out of time. So we're going to cover some topics, but I really want to leave it open for Q&A. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that at the end, but I'm going to leave a little extra time for that. Um, so before I get going, um, by a show of hands, are there uh, startups here that are interested in potentially uh, hiring some fractional executives? Anyone out there? Okay. Are there any startups that have hired fractionals before? Okay. Uh, who's interested in becoming a fractional? All right, that's good. That's great. This is this is we get a lot of uh, input that way. Um, any venture capital firms that have worked with or are considering working with fractionals to help their startups in their portfolios? Okay, got a couple of those as well. Uh, anybody performing fractional work, whether it's at the executive level or otherwise? Wow, all right, this is great. So we have, we have things that we're gonna cover for all groups. I like it, uh, so let's hop in. So I want to introduce our uh, panel members. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a fractional is, and then we're gonna go through some questions, and then we'll open up for Q&A. So uh, on our panel here, uh, we have Brian DeShazer. He is, Brian, raise your hand, yep, is a fractional COO. We have Dan DeGolier, a fractional CFO. We have Jamie Verdon, who's a fractional CIO, CTO. And Julie Kopp, who's a fractional chief product officer. So uh, before we hop into a bunch of the topics, I'd like to turn it over to our panel. If you could introduce yourself, uh, let us know more around the why you got into fractional and your ideal clients. That would be really, really helpful. And uh, Dan, if you want to kick it off. Awesome. Thanks so much. So my name is Dan DeGolier. I'm the founder of Ascent CFO Solutions. We're a fractional CFO firm. Um, I identified a need after taking a, a full-time CFO role back in probably 2008 and realized that they, they really didn't need a full-time. They, need, they needed what I was good at, but it wasn't a full-time role. And that was kind of my light bulb moment. So I've been building a firm since then. We're now about uh, 40 total people on the team and uh, growing, growing rapidly. We provide both CFO services, but also the full accounting stack as well. Excellent. Thank you. I'm Brian DeShazer. I'm a fractional COO. I've been in this space coming up on two years. I was a uh, full-time W-2 for 32 years. My job was completely controlled by the interest rate. So over the course of 32 years, being laid off eight times, you get a little tired of it. So um, at the last one, I tapped out and I decided, well, if I'm going to put, if my career is going to be in the hands of someone, it's going to be in my hands. And so I, <laughs> I had to tell this story yesterday, but... Um, margaritas, half in the bag, um, and pizza, and I'm now sitting here as a fractional COO. So. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Kopp. Um, I got into fractional work about seven years ago. I was doing some pretty large digital transformations. My last one was with an oil and gas company, 
and realized that really what a lot of companies needed was to transform their organizations. And that's how I got involved with it. Um, I do a lot of uh, fractional product leadership, but I also do a lot of strategic advising and product coaching, um, depending on the stage you're in. Uh, particularly my ideal uh, customer profile is a scale-up company because at that point you really do need a chief product officer to start to think about what type of organization and company after you get product market fit at the startup stage. I do a ton of mentoring. I work a lot with Techstars um, and help founders uh, understand how to get to product market fit, coach them to where they need to go because they're really the chief product officer in a startup. So um, I help support and mentor in those areas, but I love it, love what I do. I get to meet incredible people and learn about new industries. So. Hi, I'm Jamie Vernon, I'm your company's IT guy. Um, I got into Fractional about a year ago after, much like Brian, lots of times in the corporate world and then ending not on my terms. Um, I'm a managing partner of Alt Digital. We focus on cybersecurity, on artificial intelligence, on automation, and on Fractional leadership. Um, our, our customers are mostly the 50 to 250 employee range. And while those of you who are in the startup space are worrying about building this product, building this, this you know, killer app, whatever it might be, uh, we help talk about things like scalability of your of technology stack, global, uh, governance risk and compliance of your technology stack, and how to make your business more scalable with less brain damage from you. Thanks, Jamie. All right, want to hop into, I think this might help set the stage here. Into the mic. Yeah, sorry. This might help set the stage here a little bit in terms of the differences of the various different roles. Actually, let me take this off because I want to look at this. Okay. So we put together a chart here that talks about fractional executives, consultants, interims, and advisors. And I want to call out some of these because uh, very important to frame up what we're talking about here. Fractional is a relatively new uh, discipline, and uh, these are the generally accepted ways that people refer to these in the space these days. So fractionals, uh, a very important thing between, the difference between a fractional and a consultant is fractionals are embedded with the team. They typically uh, don't have an end date to their engagements. They will have direct reports. They will join board meetings. They will join senior leadership meetings. The only difference being is a fractional is there for one day a week, three days a week, two days a week. So it's just like any other executive that's gonna be on your team, but they're not there for a full work week. Um, they many times will also represent the company externally. You'll see a lot of parallels with interims, and the main difference is typically an interim role is going to be there full time, but not permanent. So, a very, very similar in, in the uh, in the the different uh, elements that they're doing here. From a consulting standpoint, usually project based, usually not embedded with the team, not full time, and usually don't represent the company externally uh, or lead a group. And then uh, advisor, which is completely different, um, has a whole different set of characteristics. But for those of you that do fractional work, you probably know this. And for those of you that are fractional curious about getting into it, many folks, and even the folks here on the panel, do multiple different roles here. So I know some of the, the team members here do um, advisory work. They've done consulting projects on the side. They've done fractional work. So it's not always you're doing one or the other. You might have a mix or a portfolio of different things that you work on. So just wanted to call that out to set the stage for today. The one other thing I wanted to say, if you want to get in contact with anybody here, um, we've got names up here, but on all these little tables around the back, we have a one-pager that you can take a picture of. It's got a ton of resources on the front and the back, networking groups you could join for free, services that do uh, matchmaking, plugging you into engagements, plugging startups into fractionals. It's got all our contact information. Uh, so if you want to take a picture of it, you can, but there's also a sign-up sheet. So if you want us to email it to you, just sign up in the back, but around all the tables. So I just don't feel like you need to uh, jot a ton of stuff down, but that, that's all there. All right, so now um, I want to get into some questions. So uh, Julie, I'll kick this off with you. From a startup's perspective, or really any business perspective, 
how do they know when is the right time to hire a fractional and why would they do that? So my experience um, is that you want to get a fractional in, in one of two ways, in, the, in startups and in scale-ups. In the startup space where you really need the expertise and you really can't afford necessarily to pay for a full-time person or it doesn't make sense for where you are. What a fractional brings is deep, deep experience and knowledge and expertise in their, in their area. So for me, you know, I've had a client that's come to me and say, I need a fractional chief product officer. And when I talk to them, I'm like, that's not what you need, but here's what you need. Let's get you that and then move on from there. And actually what we should get you is a chief revenue officer, a fractional, to help you get to the next stage. So it's all about understanding where you are and where you're trying to get to and knowing what expertise you need and what you don't need. And then you can determine, do I just need someone advising? Do I actually need someone to fill this role for me and represent me? And do I need someone to maybe like accelerate me? In the scale-up space, that's when you've got product market fit, you're going pretty hard, and now you need to scale your company maybe to profitability, maybe to a different growth metric. That's when you start to look at, do I have the right people in the right seats in the right organization? A fractional is going to come in, be able to evaluate that, and then determine how do we get you to that next stage in a much more efficient and cost-effective way. Thanks, Julie. And Dan, I wanted to ask you, because fractional CFO has been around longer than any of these disciplines, so this is like the longest running type of role, and I know you work with a larger firm, but you might answer that question differently. Yeah, I think um, the way that we look at it is you you probably need to hire a fractional CFO when you hit a, search, a certain inflection point and the way you've been doing things doesn't necessarily work anymore. So I think we think about maybe you've, you've raised a round of capital, you're looking to raise a round of capital, you really have figured out product market fit and now you're starting to scale the business and so you need, you need better forecasting, you need um, to understand what your, um, what your cash flow looks like as far as, as far as your runway, as far as what it's gonna take to continue to sustain the business um, and get you really you know, go into the deep data, to create some good forecasts to, to really understand things on a go forward basis. That's, that's when we find, we usually engage with clients is when they've, they've reached a, an inflection point. Thank you. And Brian, I know on the COO side, you come in many times to fix problems. So I think there's a totally different profile of company you work with. Can you talk a little bit more about that from an operations perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I'm usually brought in way too late. Um, and everything that I'm doing is very reactive. So the ideal uh, world for me is actually working with the company early, early on um, when before the CEO, the founder, the co-founder um, is irritating their staff, before they are running themselves ragged, before they're worn out and burnt out and they can't give to the organization. So uh, bringing me in early um, while the tech team is working at building the app, the technology, whatever they're building and building tech debt I'm working on the other side to put in operational infrastructure and work on process debt and clean that up so that we're working hand in hand. And so by the time we go to market, uh, everything is running smoothly so that first onboarded customer does not have a poor experience. So speaking of technical debt, Jamie, you prevent that from happening. So when, when do you typically engage with organizations? When is too early, the right time, too late? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I mean, between cloud services of any kind, generative AI, and the ability to go down to Best Buy and get a laptop. Uh, lots of companies can go from zero to 10 employees without needing me. The, the setup wizard, as it will, um, those are pretty straightforward and they're, they're fine. Um, the challenge is when people start building that product or that service, the, the killer app or whatever it is, MVP, minimum viable product, typically doesn't include change management, security controls, the things that an organization needs in, in order to stay stable, in order to be able to grow. And so when and a company starts bumping into those and you know, a new release came out and it, it you know, broke more than it fixed, that's when people start saying, what am I doing wrong? I'm get, am I getting out ahead of my skis? How do I fix this? And people like me come and get involved. Thanks, Jamie. Um, moving on, I wanted to talk in fairness about this type of new role, some things related to pros and cons. There's a lot of pros, but there's also downsides. Um, uh, Brian, why don't you kick this one off? T talk about some of the benefits of working with fractionals that you've experienced and you've seen in the space. 
Sure. Um, and Julie mentioned it. Um, you know, we can come in and hit the ground running uh, pretty quickly. We don't, our onboarding time is really short. Um, the time that we spend in meetings is a lot shorter. Our focus is pretty lasered. Um, and we can help get things done, move things forward, um, reposition people, reposition the organization, reposition product, whatever that might look like for the organization. So um, I, from a positive standpoint, that's some of the benefits that we bring to the table is that um, we hit the ground running when we walk in the door. Uh, we're not going through an onboarding with HR. We're not going through uh, many other things. Now, we spend time learning the culture. We spend learning the technology. We spend learning the operations. We have to do that. But um, we are coming in in a very different space uh, up to you know 20 hours a week, sometimes less. Um, and so we've got a lot to do in a really short amount of time. And on the amount of time, I, I've seen a lot of businesses also flex up and flex down. So you might launch in, provide a ton of time at the beginning, you, you go to steady state. Some folks even tail off at the end and they become advisors. So there's a whole uh, ebb and flow with the business as the needs are there. From a CFO perspective, what, what are the benefits that your customers have seen by hiring Fractional? I think it's unique because you can get an incredibly talented person on your team that you otherwise certainly wouldn't be able to afford, and maybe they wouldn't even have um, enough challenge that they would be they would engaged, but you can get that person on your team for a day a week, a day and a half, two days a week, and they can really move the needle, um, and you, you've got this you know, really incredible, incredibly talented person who's on your team, in your board meetings, in your executive dis discussions, you know, s deeply engaged with that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to, uh, to, to access. You might, you know, be able to, uh, uh, you know, promote somebody to CFO who maybe is um, not, you know, quite at that level. They're kind of pushing it. Maybe they haven't had a ton of fundraising experience or exit experience or things like that. Um, so we, you can you can get this incredibly talented person who joins your team at a really affordable, cost-effective rate. Uh, Jamie, Julie, anything you want to add? Sure. I mean, one of the major benefits that we bring, especially in IT, I'm going to say something, and some of you will chuckle. This is the way it's always been done here. That is all the time in IT shops, largely because they're so thinly staffed that they don't necessarily have time to go off and do that con ed. They don't necessarily network with their peers. But as a, as a fractional, if I'm spending three days a, a week in, in your house, I'm spending two days a week in somebody else's. And so I, I'm, I get to have that perspective of another way to do a thing, whether that's which brand of PC do we buy to negotiating multi-year contracts, technology decisions, technology service provider decisions. And so I can help your team get out of the rut of, this is how it's always been done here. So I would say three things. One is you get immense value for what you're investing in a fractional. Uh, everything that Brian was saying, we just come in very quickly and efficiently and, and execute. Um, number two, we, you get coaching with it too. We've been doing this a long time, so if you have a high potential and you just, they're just not ready for that leadership level, you get a lot of modeling and coaching uh, as part of what we bring to the table. The third thing, which um, the feedback that I've gotten the most, is that your success is my success, so I'm going to be so brutally honest with you. I'm not going to play the politics of a leadership team. I'm going to come in and say, this is what's happening. This is what you need to do. It's your choice if you do it, but I'll be very clear on the risk and the opportunity. Um, and that, to me, is the most valuable thing, because they're going to get a very honest voice and someone who's not going to screw around with you know, trying to make sure everybody's happy and everybody's aligned with stuff. That's alignment's part of it, but it's also being very honest very quickly to get you to success as, as efficiently and as cost effectively as possible. I want to add something there. So for, for those of you that are fractional curious, um, you know, being a CRO, I've always reported to the CEO. And that's an interesting you know, uh, environment to be in. When you switch to fractional, it completely changes. You are no longer seen as an employee, you are seen as a partner. And that dynamic is incredible. And to, to Julie's point, that honesty, you don't have any incentive to tell them anything other than the truth. Like you're not positioning for a raise, you're not politicking, you're not doing anything, you are just driving value. When the CEO or whoever you're reporting to sees that, um, it builds a level of trust that uh, is not seen traditionally in, in, in other means. The other point that you called out is 
a lot of the times we work as fractionals and write ourselves out of the equation. That could be training or up-leveling, maybe a VP to take that role, helping them staff and hire the replacement to hand off. So this isn't necessarily a, uh, it can be, but it's not always a multi-year engagement. This just might be helping the organization grow and then hiring that full-time leader as a handoff. Now, to be honest about all of the stuff, let's talk about some of the challenges and potential cons of, of hiring a fractional. Um, would you like to kick it off? Yeah, I think, I think people think they need to hire a full-time CFO sooner than they really need to. Um, as an organization grows, we find that you can um, start to build in that infrastructure of, of, account, of accounting support, and, and director of finance, controllers, whatever that looks like, and that, that that really strategic CFO can continue to support for a couple for you know longer than you think, and, and it becomes uh, from a from an overall cost effectiveness standpoint um, even even greater. Uh, Brian, anything you want to add? You know, um, I think some of the challenges, and I mentioned it earlier, is I'm, I'm brought in too late. Um, and so I'm spending, when you talked about uh, spending a number of hours up front, um, I'm spending a lot more hours up front that is really unnecessary or could have been prevented um, had I been you know, brought in a little bit earlier. And then as I'm working alongside the team members, um, you know, I'm work, as you mentioned, I'm working myself out of a job. Uh, and I'm working myself to bring in, uh, working with them and um, working to bring in other folks, perhaps a full-time uh, COO, um, you know, once I'm ready to depart. And I have an overlap. Um, so as I'm transitioning out, I've worked with them to bring and to hire that full-time person and then um, I'm handing it off and there's a warm handoff with about 30 to 45 day overlap. Yeah, and th that could be kind of a challenge because you've built up all these relationships and then you're, you're leaving at some point. So, I mean, Jamie, could you talk about like how, how have you set that up and teed that up for success? I, I, I could talk about how I've done it. I know you have a different, uh, you may have a different approach to that, but how, how, do you, how do you set that up at the beginning, the middle, and as you're winding down an engagement to make sure things go smoothly? I mean, first and foremost, I'd say, you know, make sure that that's clearly delineated in the, in the governing paperwork. You get a statement of work that says, I'm here to accomplish X or Y or Z, and the, the payment schedule, the retainer, blah, 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 fine, whatever. But certainly when you start to meet with the team, whether that's the team for whom you were working, your peer group, the team that you're leading, set that expectation of, I'm here to set you up for success without me. I mean, even as a, as a, a salaried individual, Everybody wants to have a night's, weekend's vacations, right? Everybody wants to be able to go home and have dinner with their family, not be interrupted by a phone call of some emergency. And so every leader, regardless of the nature of the relationship, has that burden to make themselves not a necessary part of the equation. And to say, I'm setting Bob or Janet or whoever it is up for success so they can get the spotlight, they can get the credit, they can lead this issue with minimal no input from me. And that's just more upfront in a, in, a, in a fractional leadership sort of role because you're not part of the organization, as it were. And people get nervous when you're an employee and they go, oh, are you, are you looking to leave? No, I'm looking for you to be successful. And you have to learn to sell that with credibility as a fractional, as a not necessarily full-time employee leader, it's easier to have that conversation in a much more upfront fashion. And then you can say, I'm here to set you up to have this job full-time, let's go. I like the expectation setting. Julie, what things have you learned about kicking off an engagement and expectation setting with your clients that have proven the most effective? Um, so that's what I was going to say. That I think the biggest challenge sometimes is the expectation um, of what a fractional is and how, what, how to best work with a fractional. You know, this, this engagement that I'm in right now, the way I structured it was I came in as a strategic advisor to help them with their... Um, yearly planning, and they're on the uh, fiscal year, uh, June to June. So, but what it became very apparent was there's a lot of work that needed to be done on the product side. So I came in as an interim, and I said, listen, I'll do this for four months, all in, get you back on track. Then I go down to fractional for four months, and then I'll go to advising for four months, and I'm gone. Well, it's become very clear they need way more than that, so I'm actually staying as a fractional, as, a, as an interim until June next year. But that is my goal, is to figure out where, what do you need right now? How do I help you get there? Um, and because of the work I've done, and then another colleague of mine who's a fractional CTO, 
um, they are all in on fractionals and they are ready to scale. Um, Brian's actually talking to them um, as well because they see the value. Uh, we have gotten them, you know, in, in two months, I've turned around the product organization. I've been able to execute on getting the empowered team structured, working really closely with the CTO um, and the engineering department, as well as we've got compliance and risk and um, all these and strategy. But it's really making sure that the CEO understands why you're there, what the plan is once you do the assessment, is really understand this is what it's going to take. Let's make sure we're partnering, as you said, and then execute to that. And, and I'm always there to adjust. I've certainly had clients where they've expected me to do something. I've put it down in the contract. Here's what we're going to go do. And they change their mind. And it's not in writing. And I've learned a lot. Of, we've all learned hard lessons about how to make sure that we're adhering to it. And you know, we've I've I've fired clients because they create unrealistic expectations, as well as they get into sometimes panic mode and they just use any resource they have. And I get it. You get into a scarcity mindset, and you're like, I've got these resources. I'm just going to leverage them for whatever I can. But that doesn't really respect the value that we bring. And so, um, it's really setting very clear expectations and deliverables and what the outcomes are gonna be from the engagement. Julie, that's a really good point. That's, you, you made me think of another value that maybe isn't, isn't obvious to everybody, which is when you, you can scale up and down for projects. So we, we'll get hired for purpose X, and then within, within 30 days, purpose Y sort of you know, bubbles to the top. And so you've, you know, there might be a, a fundraising or, or a, a, a very uh, deep financial modeling project. And so we'll, we'll spend some time on that. That, sca that can scale back down and you're, you're, you know, clients are paying by, in our case, we're paying, clients are paying by the hour. So they're just you know, buying by the bite, getting just what they need on a day-to-day on a, on a -day basis, which I think is something you obviously don't get, even with interim, let alone, let alone um, full-time. Dan, I want to build on that because this this next topic is what we get asked all the time is what does it cost? What are the business models used? How do you pay for it from both the company side, uh, from negotiation, from the fractional side? I saw so many fractional curious folks. They ask us this all the time. So can you talk about maybe the models you commonly use or even other ones? I know there's a, a bunch out there, some better than other pros and cons, but tell us, tell us some of the Tell us some of the norms. We've tried fixed fee a couple times. We find that hourly works better just because it does scale up and down. We'll have a monthly minimum because we want, we're going to be dedicating a resource, one or more resources to the client. So we've got to have a kind of a minimum uh, you know, revenue amount, a bill amount for that. But um, it's for us, it's, you know, and different, different people have different rates. So obviously CFOs are going to be a lot more expensive than senior accountants. Okay, good. I, Brian, I think you're more retainer model. Is that right? So can you talk about yeah. like why you use that, why it works, you know, questions that people ask about that type of model? Sure. Um, I am on retainer. So um, I charge one fee at the beginning of the month um, for a set number of hours. Um, I am outcomes based. So I don't work, you know, um, this hour. I, I'm supposed to work 20 hours this week. I may not work 20 hours this week. I might work, might work 30. They put me on retainer for 60. I might work 30. I might work 10. I might work 40, depending upon what's happening. Um, and so that's my, that's my position. I've tried the hourly rate. Um, it doesn't really work. I put the hourly rate in one time um, and it's actually in my contract for some um, and it's the pain in the butt fee. Um, so if you violate my boundaries outside of the hours and call me <coughs> six, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night and expect me to answer the phone, then you're going to get my hourly rate times three. And, and the other thing about that is they're not paying for your time. They're paying for your wisdom or your knowledge, right? So sometimes those for specific disciplines don't fit the best. And you all know, working in business, nothing works uh, a static 20 hours a week. But things ebb and flow. You might be closing a customer contract. It could be really could be anything. So uh, for a lot of these roles, uh, being flexible with that uh, up and down every month, the retainer model works well. Julie, do you do the same or do you do any, yeah, like, no, do mine, you do any outcomes driven things? I do com all retainer. And I, what I do is I come in and assess, like even the client that said they wanted a fractional CPO, I came in and talked to him. I said, no, you need a two-day strategy session and this is what it costs for me to come in and do two days of strategy with you. So it depends on the scope of what you need. And I, I do a retainer. Um, I do a percentage of my time. The thing that's really important because of the market and because of what's been going on, I will not do anything for equity. 
because it just isn't worth it. And so that's what's sometimes really hard, especially as a startup, because it, that's what you have, is a lot of equity to be able to give. Um, and you will, you will find fractionals that will do it for equity, but those of us who have been doing it for a pretty long time, it just, our time's pretty valuable. We've got, I've got 30 years experience doing this, and so there are people that will pay for my time, and that's where I'll go. Um, that's why I do a lot of mentoring, because you get that for free. So um, to me, the retainer model works best for me, because it's, it's engaging, and then we will flex, right? So the one I have right now where they've, they're going to commit for an entire year, they get a much better pricing on my retainer than if I was doing it for three months or just six months. And Julia, I think you mentioned to me one other time, but as you wind down on a project and they ask you to become an advisor, then when you have a good working relationship, yeah. you know the all the... Oh, it scales. Upside and yeah. downside. Yeah. Then you would consider doing that, maybe some additional pay or maybe just equity from an advisor. Yeah, even this one was, you know, I, I came in as an advisor. That was one cost. It went up when I became, pretty significantly when I became the interim. It'll go down when I become fractional, and then it will go down further when I become the advisor. And again, the scope of what I do is very different, and my time commitment's very different. By that point, though, I've invested a lot, and I know their company pretty, pretty well now, um, so I become even more valuable to help them get things done very quickly. Jamie, any other interesting models that you've employed successfully, unsuccessfully, that you care to share? One of the big questions we have is, what change do you want? Um, a lot of what happens in my world is around compliance to regulations like PCI, HIPAA, SOC 2, NIST stuff. And if you want me to tell you where you are, we have a fixed fee engagement ready to go. And I'll tell you, you got this checked off, you don't have that checked off, and oh boy. Um, if you want me to come in and fix that, if you want me to come in and get you compliant, that will not be fixed fee because that's going to require the engagement of your team. That's going to be subject to the fluctuations of whatever happens with your business and with your customers. Um, that's a very separate conversation. But a, a workshop, uh, you know, an, a commitment to coaching, um, those things can be fixed fee. We're ready to go. But it, it's, it's no change. It is simply an assessment of what is in your world. Okay, so you got a, a, a deliverable base or a project base, and then awesome. Okay, so we got about 16 minutes left, and I wanted to get into Q&A because I, I bet a lot of folks out there have questions. So, Megan, I think we have a microphone around. So if anybody has questions, feel free. We got, got, our, first, we got our first volunteer right over there. So uh, you're going to steal my mic? Okay. Who is the first question? Coming over. Hi. I never heard of Fractional until two weeks ago. And I had two different people tell me I should become a Fractional CTO. My background is I've done a lot of startups. I spent 20 years in Silicon Valley. Um, the roles you had up there, I didn't really see there. So I'm just curious if anybody could speak to what CTOs, what companies are looking for CTOs to do and at what stage, because I, I can see value in a couple different stages. Well, we have somebody on this panel that can answer that for you. That would be great. <laughs> so my first question for anybody who's looking to be a fractional anything is, how hungry are you? Because it's not just the, the, the business of being that C-level for a given company, but it's also managing your own business. Go off and get the LLC. You got to manage your accounting. You get, a, get an accountant. God help you. Um, <laughs> make a friend in finance. <laughs> but if you're, if you're going to be a fractional CTO, look for uh, a guy I know who calls them idea rats, but who don't really know how to build it past that first wireframe. I mean, you've run into them, I've run into them. They have a good idea, they can make it work on my PC, on, on their laptop or whatever it is, but they don't know how to do it at scale, whether it's you know, engaging Kubernetes or Docker or these sorts of, of microservices technologies, how to make it usable to a large audience. Um, bring perspective. This is a great technology, put a different user interface on it. This is, this is a great idea. Have you thought about presenting it to these other people, this other market? And you know you, that may be a CTO sort of conversation, might be a CMO sort of conversation. But if you're looking for access to these sorts of forums where you can find people looking for you, a lot of those resources are on the sheets that Christian mentioned earlier that are out there on the smaller tables. 
So uh, one thing, just if you want to become a fractional, like it's, it, the, big, the biggest challenge is actually business development, like finding people. And unless you have a really deep network, it is one of the most discouraging parts. There's not a ton of, of work out there for fractional chief product officers. Everything comes from my network of people I know. From a CTO perspective, a lot of startups need fractional CTOs. I would say that is one of the areas that they are, um, that I have found where they struggle the most. And so it's really defining what that role is, but what they really need are hands-on CTOs, not a strategic, not a sort of, I'm gonna make sure that um, your everything's in order. It's really that more VP of engineering that wants to get in there and understand stuff, but the same thing, like taking your experience and scaling them to the next level. The challenge is finding those clients because sometimes they don't know what they don't know, and it's, it's education as well. Thanks, Julie. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about the industries where you find fractional talent in uh, uh, assignments in a fractional state to be more widely adopted or more commonplace, and then other industries where you see it emerging that it's, it hasn't even begun to, to become a, a commonplace model of engagement? I can tell you, I, I only work with B2B SaaS firms. There's fractional help helping them all over the place, very, very uh, becoming more common now? I would say it's everywhere. It's, um, I, I did a lot of digital health for a while, um, lots there. I'm doing FinTech right now, I've done it in space tech. It's, I don't think there's any one area that's more than others, it's more what needs do they have. There's way more need for fractional CFOs um, and CMOs than I see for like product and technology, but it's, is starting to evolve and change. I haven't really seen, I don't know if anyone else has, but it's pretty widespread now, pretty much everywhere. Which really means it's a function more of scale of a given company, not necessarily resistance or acceptance within a, a given industry. It's gonna be, oh, you're a global blah, 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 blah. You probably don't need a fraction, you probably need a full time. We see it's any company that's, that's under $50 million in revenue, you know, uh, you know, there's a, there's a point, there's kind of a breaking point when you reach a certain scale where you probably have a full-time team. But across industries, I mean, we, we work across almost every industry you can think of. Um, you know, I think there might be some things that are a little special, like oil and gas, pretty specialized, maybe a little bit less, less in, in something like that. But um, yes, yeah, space tech, certainly, certainly SaaS, B2B and otherwise, um, are, are huge, are, are in an area that there's a wide, wide, spread adoption. Thank you. I think we have a question over there. Hey guys, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm looking to launch into marketing, uh, fractional marketing and consulting. So this has been extremely insightful. Thank you. Uh, one question uh, I have, Julie, you brought up, stay away from the temptation of any kind of equity play. Uh, if any of you guys can add color to that, uh, why you would want to stay away from that uh, that would be insightful for the group. Because it's very, very rare it actually comes to fruition. There's zero value in the equity. Because what they need very early on, um, and I, I have done, I used to do one client a year advisory for equity. Um, very rewarding. If you want to do that, I, I, there was a lot of value in it just because I met some great people and, um, you know, they're still very much part of my network. This person became, a, you know, I'm coaching them now. But it's just, it's, it's a lot of work for little return. There's just, um, like in digital healthcare, that is like seven to ten years before you get to maybe your Series A. So it just, there aren't any unicorns really. It's so, so rare that people are able to turn their equity around. And by the time it gets back to you, it's so diluted. It's just not worth it, in my opinion. For others, it might be because they want to get in there and they want to start working. And it might be a great path forward, but just eyes wide open when you go into accepting equity, in my opinion. Fair answer. Yep. yep. Other questions? Hi. Oh. Hi. My name is Gaurav. My question is regarding integration of fractionals in the team. As a business owner, if I am planning to bring in a fractional, I clearly understand the need. But let's say I get one of you guys in. The team with whom you will be working might see you as a threat and might also be vying the position. And they might not like your guidance or uh, the fact that many of you said that you, all of you work on retainers. So the real ownership still lies on the team not on you, right? And you're only gonna talk to the team once or twice in a 
but in a week, that's the time you are spending. What is the role that I need to play as a business owner and what's the role that you play to make sure that a team bonds together, accept this change and move forward? Great question, probably the most important one to ask. Glad you asked that. Yep. We, we want to work directly, we want to be integrated and very much part of that team, right? I mean, we're only going to be effective as, if, we're, if we are that, that CFO, we're part-time, but that CFO on the team. I think I see the opposite as far as uh, feeling threatened. We, if, uh, we will mentor the, the junior people and, and, and the retention increases because, because the junior people don't see a ceiling above them. They feel like they've got a mentor, someone who's not trying to, to stay in that job forever. They're, they're there to move the needle, make things effective, and then, and then step out of the way and let other people grow, in, grow into it. So we don't, we don't see a, a, um, that people feel threatened by fractional aid. And, and you know, kind of to our discussion earlier, we also stay above the fray when it comes to politics and the um, and, and all of the you know empire building or things you might see in a, in a company because we're there to do a job, get in, get out, move, you know, be effective, and, and let somebody else uh, you know take it from there. Yeah, I think the number one thing is be honest and be transparent. So. When you are bringing in a fractional, make sure you're very honest with the team, the role of this person. They're there to make them better. They're there to help them. And if somebody raises their hand and say, well, I was hoping to be that leader, awesome, then let's make sure this person's coming in to help you get there. That's part of their role. So the more honest and transparent you are, um, the better. But certainly, it can be very threatening. That's a reality. Um, it's all how the leader sets it up for success or not. And I would add to that, because I've been in that situation, um, but um, I've been being very transparent, but continuing our support while we're there. It's not a one and done. So you've got to be there. So when someone does raise their hand or they you know, feel threatened, it's you also having that conversation, helping us out all the way through the process, because we're there for you, we're there for the company, um, and we want to make sure that we're doing the best job we can. So. Got a lot of questions. Um, this is going to spin right off of that question, actually. Brian, you had mentioned that you guys hit the ground running, and I was relieved to hear you say that you guys learn the culture first, because in my opinion, that's extremely important. Can you expand on what you do to actually learn the culture and learn the people of the company to build that trust? When I step in, it's... It, it's probably no secret that I love to talk. Um, and so I love meeting people. I want to learn everything about everyone I'm going to be working with, not at just my, my peer level, but their teams as well. And so understanding everything about the history of the company. How did you get here? What are some of the challenges that you've faced? What are some of the successes? How do you work together as a team? And what are some of those challenges? And so as I begin to look to see how I'm going to fit, um, I listen to all of that and then begin to build a path. And I hit roadblocks. I certainly do. And that is absolutely OK. But uh, with the great support and team and leadership helping guide you, um, you can navigate those and keep going. So. So yeah, I do the same thing. I uh, immediately come in and I actually ask the leadership team not to tell me about the team. And so I go through and I say, give me a week to go talk to everybody. And I ask them, what's working, what's not? What are you most excited about? What's the most challenging, frustrating? Where do you want to see yourself? What do you love about your job? I just learn about as much about them as we can. And we're really good at like then seeing the patterns. You'll see patterns very quickly. And you'll see some themes coming out. And then you can go back and validate with the leadership What's going on? What's your perspective on this? And again, I would never go into an engagement unless I had the time to actually meet everybody. And usually they're not massive teams. Um, and I like to see across functional, like not only the product organization or technology, but who else is working with them and what's their experience as well. Yeah, when, when I kick them off, I do one-on-ones with all the team members that I'll be working with. And I share my statement of work, like my timeline, what the executives want me to work on, so there's no doubt what I'm there to do, what I'm not there to do. And I, I tell them about the roll-off in the, in the future. And I think when they see that, that really helps them you know, br bring down a lot of those walls and barriers they have at the beginning. Uh, being that this is a growing industry and that there's no shortage of fractional talent out there, 
uh, if you were to put yourself in the shoes of one of your prospective clients or someone that is looking to engage with a fractional or an advisor, what suggestions might you have for how they should go about finding and identifying the right fit, the right firm, the right person? So um, understand what you're looking for, what your problem is you're trying to solve. Go find those people and, and evaluate those people on the experience they have. Have they done this before? There's a lot of people out there, uh, particularly the last couple of years, who have, are out of work and are just trying to figure out, is this something I want to do? If you haven't done it before, um, it's, it's not easy because we all bring our tool books with us, our, our toolbox, if you will, and we meet you where you're at. So you want to really interview people on um, how do you approach each one. Like, there's no one way to do product. I'm not going to come in and say you have to do it this way. I want to understand you, your culture, how you work, what you need. I'd say Brian probably does the same thing where it's like there's no one way, but we want to make sure we're solving for you. So that's a red flag if someone comes and said this is the only way to do it, this is how I do everything. Be careful of that, but really make sure they're hearing you and understanding the problem you're solving and they have a, have a way to meet you where you're at. And they're not trying to sell you more than you need. That's the other thing. We should be able to come in and very quickly evaluate for you, this is what you need and this is how we can get you to where you need to go. As far as identifying, I might say tap your referral network, um, you know, get, get some checked references, get referrals, talk to people, and, and do look, and cultural fit does matter. Um, we, we do a cultural matching when we're onboarding a potential new client. We want to understand, are you just looking for a yes person who's going to agree with the, the CEO, or do you want somebody who's going to challenge, bring new ideas, maybe be a bit, bit of a devil's advocate in some cases. And so we're kind of looking for uh, clients who, who are looking for that. If they just want someone just to you know, sit at the desk and do the job, you know, we're not going to be able to, to add as much value as, as somebody who we're really brought in to, uh, to, to, to collaborate. In, in the resource sheet I was talking about, there are companies out there that do matchmaking between fractionals to businesses with certain specialties, so check that out. There are uh, organizations that if you're interested in becoming a fractional, they'll tell you all the good and bad things about it in a short session and then do a course with you to help you set up your practice. There are providers in there that will uh, train a business how to successfully hire their first fractional. So there's all a bunch of resources out there to help with, with those sorts of things. We're almost at time, so I think we've got time for one more question. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned one of the hardest things is business development. For all the people who are interested in going down that path, how do you guys generate business for you individually when you started? If you were going to make a recommendation to someone getting started now. 100% um, of my business is referral. Um, and business development for me is networking. Um, networking, networking, networking. And then more networking. Um, meeting people, uh, having people introduce you to their people. Look for your synergy partners. Like who can introduce you, who can introduce you, who can introduce you. I met someone at the Boulder Startup Week who opened that door um, and I now have a proposal out for um, a role. So it took several months to happen, but it was, uh, I believe, six introductions before I got to someone that could introduce me. So learn, um, build your brand, um, both publicly, professionally, um, and network. So he's a master at it. I hate it. I'm, I absolutely hate networking. I hate putting myself out there. Um, I, these events, I like being up here. I don't like being mingling and things like that. But that, so like LinkedIn, there's all sorts of resources. We're all part of Fractionals United. Um, it's a free uh, community uh, out there. Um, there's lots of folks out there that are just incredibly supportive and will do courses on how do you get thought content and stuff like that out there. My one piece of advice is don't try to be everything to everyone. Be very clear about what it is you do best because I've seen people like put out there like they can do CPO, CTO, CIO, CSO. I can do everything. Well, if you can't figure out what it is you do well, then nobody else is going to be able to figure it out from you. So instead of being a jack of all or jack, Jill of all trades, like really get focused on what you do and find those people that need what you do best. When it comes to business development, the magic is in your network. Yep. And one last thing, business development never stops. Ever. 
All right. Well, thank thank you to the panel. Thank you, Denver Startup Week. I think this was great. We're going to be hanging out in the back. If you want to network or otherwise, please sign up if you want more information. A lot of good resources there. And thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.